Hey everybody, thank you for joining us for our second webinar Wednesday in 2021. We have Dr. Angela McClure joining us today, who is going to be talking about considerations for growing corn silage. Um, I'm very excited to hear this talk. This is an area that I'm definitely weak in, so it's always good for me to learn more along with all of you. Um, I will be posting the recording afterwards, just in case anybody has to jump off early, um, or you know anyone who needed to see this webinar and wasn't able to join us today. Just make sure that everybody that needs to watch this registers through the Question Pro platform and I'll send the recordings back out along that platform. I'll also be throwing the post completion survey link up into the chat here in just a minute. Um, but please fill out that survey afterwards if you need master dairy credit or if you need in service credit for this. That way I have a record of you being here and we can track our impacts that way as well. If you have any questions throughout, please throw them in the chat and I'll relay them to Angela, um, or we can raise hands and unmute towards the end of the meeting, or Angela, if you wanna take questions in the middle, it's completely up to you. That's fine. I mean, if somebody has a question and they type it in the chat box, you know, in the middle, you know, I don't mind stopping and, and addressing it, that's fine. All right, sounds good. Well, with that, Angela, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, well, thank you, Liz. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm on Central Time, so it's still morning for us here in Jackson. Um, appreciate the opportunity to be here um, and, and visit with this group. Um, as Liz said, my name is Angela McClure, and I'm the Extension Corn and Soybean Specialist with UT. Uh, my area in corn, or, or you know, most of the research that I do uh, in corn, deals more with corn produced for grain versus silage. But you know, a lot of the, the things that, that are good things to do uh, from, you know, the standpoint of getting the crop established and some other things are, are kind of across the board, you know, whether you're talking about corn for grain uh, or silage. So um, I thought I would just kind of touch base on four different areas that are related to growing corn. Um, I know it's March and everybody's already bought the hybrids that they're going to plant this year, but I thought I would talk a little bit about you know, why we select hybrids that we do. A little bit about planting, um, a little bit in the fertility area, and kind of finish up talking a little bit about timing um, of silage harvest. So, uh, you know, again, I, you know, I realize everybody probably already has the corn seed that you're gonna plant this year. Um, and many of you have probably taken advantages of the, um, the uh, printed publications in your local county office. Just wanted to put a plug in for our web um, data um, uh, uh, location here. If you're not familiar with it, search.utcrops.com. Uh, we kind of went to a one-stop shop for all variety data a couple of years ago and it's worked really, really well. Um, basically, you're gonna go to um, the crop of interest and click on that, you can pull uh, the complete um, variety publication from the previous year. You can you know, look at specific tables. Uh, you can also go back and look at archive data, some older data um, if you're interested in a variety that, that might not be tested in this past year's work, but it was maybe a couple of years ago. So all of that is at search.utcrops.com. And again, we're really proud of that. Um, obviously, states nearby, uh, Kentucky and other states that you're close to, a lot of land-grant universities have silage variety data as well. Um, seed companies are all, also, um, I think, another good resource for um, variety or hybrid data because, you know, we can, we can share data, uh, yield data and silage quality data from local um, trials but companies can share additional information about the characteristics of the hybrid, like the disease package, um, the standability, some of the other things. And if you put all of that information together, I think the land grant data and the seed company information, you get a pretty good picture about how a, um, a particular hybrid is gonna perform for you. So, you know, not only do we, you know, share, I think um, our silage data, we, we have, you know, yield, um, but we also have lodging scores, um, you know, height, ear height, standability, um, you know, some information around there. Um, I think we share all of the BT um, information and the herbicide packages, but also the silage quality metrics that are measured um, at the end of the year. Um, in 2020, I think eight different um, hybrids were tested in the silage trial. 
two of those eight were actually repeats from multiple years. Um, a lot of times it's up to the seed company as far as what they want to enter in any trial, whether it's for grain yield or silage. And so sometimes we may get an opportunity to only look at a hybrid one year. If you've got two or three years data, or if you can take UT data, maybe the University of Kentucky data and some other states, um, you get, and you get a little more consistent picture, I think, about, um, about how that hybrid is going to perform. Um, so the, the silage quality metrics that are reported each year in our variety trials is kind of a, a snapshot, um, you know, for that particular year. So there are hybrids that range from, I think, about 115 day to maybe close to 119 days. So some differences in relative maturity. Um, but they're all planted at the same time and they're all harvested at the same time. And sometimes the, the timing of harvest for a, a fuller season hybrid versus a slightly earlier one might impact things like crude protein um, uh, or tonnage or di uh, digestibility. So what makes a good silage hybrid? Um, you know, for grain, we plant a lot of early corn, early and medium. You know, for silage corn, we're, we're kind of leaning more towards those fuller season hybrids. Um, a full season hybrid has the potential to uh, produce more leaves per plant, for example, than an early hybrid. I think in the 2020 data, we have, you know, on a kind of that later end of the medium scale um, and full season hybrids. Um, so something that stands well, a good lodging score. Uh, something that stays green. In other words, the dry down, you know, is, is fairly slow, uh, would be, you know, terrific for silage. Also test weight, um, and then all of the silage metrics that are important, you know, for silage um, hybrids go into making a, you know, a hybrid, a, a good one for silage. So, you know, in addition to all of this information that, that is in our variety testing book, um, there are some other reasons to choose specific hybrids and that's for pest management. Um, for example, most, um, I believe, uh, what's being tested now uh, are BT hybrids. And so, you know, BT technology, you know, uh, helps us control specific insect pests. And depending on the BT trait, there are some differences in the insects that they're particularly strong on. Um, I went and looked at, um, you know, just the last couple of years, these are the three BT traits that popped up the most often um, in the silage hybrids that were tested. And you can kind of see that the smart stacks, which is a, a double or multiple BT trait stack, is pretty good across the board for uh, a number of pests that you might expect in corn. Um, depending on your planting date, you know, the earlier planted tends to have fewer insect problems versus, you know, if you're planting uh, corn for silage in late May or in particularly June, you might expect um, to have more insect problems and the, the BT would, you know, will certainly come into play for you there. Um, you know, corn that's grown for silage in, in a, you know, corn after corn type situation, you know, there's the potential to develop insect problems like Western corn rootworm. Um, and smart stacks again has you know, uh, you know really good activity on that particular pest. So BT hybrids can be important um, for insect management. The other thing that I look at, whether it's grain I think or silage, is the disease resistance package of the hybrid. You know, if we pick the right one, sometimes it means that we do not have to worry about putting a fungicide. Um, in that field. And so that's going to save us some money. Um, I pulled a couple of hybrids from the DeCab uh, website. And, and you can kind of see the one on the left, excellent southern rust tolerance. The one on the right, probably a good silage hybrid. But, you know, if you are in a, a situation where southern rust is coming in, you need to consider a fungicide. So there are definitely, you know, differences in um, the disease resistance of hybrids. Um, if you're planting early, we tend to have fewer diseases or the diseases that we do get tend to come in late enough that oftentimes we don't have to uh, you know, worry about a foliar fungicide. But the later that we plant, you know, just like insects, you know, you plant in late May or if you're planting in June, um, you know, we tend to have more disease pressure, especially something like southern rust. Um, this is a disease that does not overwinter in Tennessee, it basically blows in from, you know, from uh, southern climates. 
And we're not always sure every year if we're going to have it or if it's going to be, you know, bad enough to treat. Um, but this is one that with later planted corn, if you have southern rust and, the, you know, we've got that, you know, the, the pressures there, um, you know, a foliar fungicide is going to be necessary unless you've got a hybrid, you know, that's got really good protection against rust. Um, if you've got um, silage grown in, you know, corn after corn after corn type scenario, um, especially in no-till, like, you know, a lot of, a lot of us do now, um, gray leaf spot, northern corn leaf blight, and diplodia, and these have the potential to hang around on surface residue and, you know, potentially infect corn each year. Um, Goss's wilt, I just mentioned this one because I know it's, it's popping up on a lot of um, uh, the profile information from seed companies. Um, it's not something that we see in Tennessee a lot. It's not everywhere. But I wanted to mention it because it is a bacterial disease. Uh, it's not a, a fungal disease, and we don't have control measures for it. So the only way to manage Goss's wilt is with a, a hybrid that has good resistance. Um, so very effective uh, way to manage diseases, you know, with the right hybrid. And again, you know, depending on planting date or what you're expecting disease-wise, you might want to lean towards a hybrid that's going to help you out. If we've got hybrids that we like, but maybe they are a little weak on some diseases, there are a number of fungicide products that, uh, that work really well on foliar corn diseases. And if you haven't been to uh, utcrops.com, uh, we've got a you know, corn and soybean area. Uh, Dr. Heather Kelly, our extension pathologist, evaluates a number of products in corn um, each year and she updates this table with some of the newer products um, but you can kind of see if you look at let me see if i can get my laser going here if you're looking at something like gray leaf spot you got a lot of fungicides that are excellent so lots to choose from northern leaf blight again you got a number there and some that are you know certainly pretty good on rust she also um, includes the harvest intervals or the harvest restrictions. And obviously for silage, this would be um, much more important, um, you know, to be aware that there's a pretty big difference in harvest interval, depending on the product that you're applying. You know, so you've got a pretty wide range there, anywhere from seven days to 36 days. But there are, luckily there are a number of products that, um, that are very effective on a number of the foliar diseases that we have. And you know, proper application uh, can help prevent um, leaf damage um, and leaf loss and contribute to, um, to better silage. I want to kind of <clears throat> change gears here just a little bit, talk about planting. Um, and you know, it's getting time. I think we've had we've had a lot of sun, we've had 70 degree temperatures. Folks are kind of stirring around, getting their planting equipment out, kind of kicking the tires and making sure things, things are kind of set up. And, and it's, it's always a good idea to do a good, you know, thorough check on the planter each year. Um, from the standpoint of, you know, planting corn, um, just, you know, a couple of things that I think are, you know, are, are good things to do if it fits our production system. Um, I think planting early gives us the best yields. Um, we've got to have an adequate stand that's going to give us the grain yield or the tonnage um, that we want. So we've got to do a good job spacing plants in the row. Um, you know, ideally with corn, you know, most of our corn is going to emerge within a couple of days. Um, and if you get uniform emergence. Sometimes that means that we have uniform tasseling and uniform maturity. So uniform emergence, I think, is also another goal uh, for corn. And we want to do a good job of, you know, closing, covering that seed and closing that furrow uh, without pinching. Uh, so um, I looked at the um, silage production guide. I think Gary Bates uh, put that together a number of years ago, and um, I think he had a, a window for planting silage, a recommended window from April 20th to early June, um, and also indicated in you know other silage production guides also indicated that usually April or early May um, 
planted silage yields better. And we see that with grain as well. Um, this is some data that was generated at, um, at Milan. We looked at planting uh, multiple hybrids anywhere from late March to early June. And we had a, a lot of different environments. So we had 2012, the drought year. Uh, we had two years where we had a lot of rain and we had two years that we had kind of typical rainfall patterns. And so I just kind of averaged uh, the yield information over those five years. And, and uh, it's kind of shown here as a, a percent uh, maximum dry land yield. So <clears throat> kind of year in, year out, um, early April, we tend to get our best grain yields. Late March is actually our runner up. We have not been able to plant a lot of corn in late March in a couple of years. It's, it's very dependent on uh, the soil moisture and soil temperature being ideal. But if we can get in, you know, grain yields are, are, are great. I mean, then as you plant, you know, later in April and early May, it sort of plateaus, not a lot of difference there is in yield. And then we get into later May and early June. Again, this is dry land conditions. And then we start getting that yield decline. So we've got a longer growing season when we plant early. Um, we're shifting when pollination occurs and usually it's a little bit cooler and we, we tend to have better soil moisture. And so we're more successful um, you know, uh, you know, pollinating those ears. Um, and typically corn planted earlier uh, matures, um, you know, like it, like it's supposed to. So, so, you know, if we're, we got folks kind of considering whether they're going to plant corn in March this year, we've had some awfully warm weather, but, you know, kind of the goal there is, you know, take the soil temperature at your planting depth. And I usually do it about two inches, about nine o'clock. And I'm looking for 50 to 55 degrees consistently across three days. And I'm also going to look at the weather forecast. Is it going to rain? We got a cold front coming through to kind of make the decision about, you know, whether I'm going to start. So, um, you know, once we, we kind of figured out, we got our hybrids, we, we figured out we're, we're, we're getting ready to plant. Um, seeding rates are, are another, I think, important consideration. Um, you know, obviously we don't want to plant too much. Uh, we got to plant what the field will, will um, uh, support, right? Because most of our corn is dry land. Water is a limiting factor. So if you overplant, you know, you've got plants that are going to compete with each other for water and fertility, um, and that's not a great thing. So there, there needs to be kind of a cap usually on yields. Um, I looked at the old um, silage production guide, and, and I think it's been a while probably since this has been revisited. Uh, the upper end final stand is 26,000, and, and my understanding is I think farmers are probably, at least on some of their better grounds especially, are planting higher than that. I noticed in the UT variety test, uh, the 2021, their seed, seed drop rate was, you know, 36,000. So uh, that was, you know, fairly high. I think Kentucky's is close to 30. Um, you know, seed companies also have some recommendations, you know, for hybrids, and, and I follow those uh, really consistently as well, um, because they've got the data on, you know, you know, how well that hybrid is going to flex the ear. So if you plant at a lower population, you've got a hybrid with good ear flex, it just flexes that ear, you might get a little bit bigger stalk um, and does, you know, does quite well. So, you know, hybrids that lodge don't need to be planted, obviously, at higher populations. Um, there was some, a little data on the DeKalb site, on their silage um, hybrid site. Uh, this was a, a study that they did, it looks like, I think, in Nebraska. But they looked at multiple years, multiple silage hybrids, and, you know, how high do you need to go on the seeding rate? And what they found was a seed drop rate of about 32,000. Um, you know, was about where they needed to be. Going above that, uh, you know, they didn't get any increase in, um, in silage biomass. So there was no reason to go, you know, higher. So um, I, I suspect that farmers are probably planting more than our uh, older uh, publication suggests. But again, it, it's a good idea to not to go too high, um, you know, for that hybrid. And also, you know, for what the ground or the soil can support.
Corn, um, unlike soybeans that have a real wide var you know, variation in seed germ percentage, corn is typically really good. I mean, a lot of times I'm, I'm looking at 93, 95% germ. So we don't have to overplant a lot to allow for some, you know, seed loss to, you know, that uh, to the, you know, to the to the low germ. Um, so, um, yeah, I, you know, these are just kind of some guidelines. Again, I, I don't have a, an answer for you, and, and we haven't done any work. This is probably an area that we probably need to do a little, a little work um, and, and do some of these comparisons. So, you know, when we're ready to plant, <clears throat> you know, we get the planter out and, uh, you know, we put the seed in and we take off and a couple of weeks later, we go back and take a look and, you know, sometimes we are surprised uh, and not pleasantly. Um, you know, I think the thing, you know, with the planter is, is to do a good job getting it set up, getting, you know, the worn pieces up, you know, up to date um, in order to avoid surprises. With corn, um, you know, not soybeans so much, but with corn, corn plants are very competitive. So the first plant that comes up, if it has a plant next to it that comes up slightly later, that first plant is going to take all the water, all the fertilizer away from that second plant. And if you're limiting, and a lot of times we are in, you know, dry land conditions, um, you know, that you've got those early emerging plants that are going to basically rob from the plants that are, you know, the seed are dropped too close. So, you know, we try to set the planter uh, for uniform plant spacing and we're not always successful, but, you know, it, it helps, I think, with stand. It helps with ear size uh, to have fairly uniform spacing so that, you know, that each of these plants has kind of equal opportunity to get the water and to get the fertilizer that it needs. If you look, um, at a field and you've got a lot of variation in plant spacing, it is a planter issue. It's not a field issue, it's a planter issue. And there's a laundry list of things that um, you need to check on the planter, um, you know, to improve plant spacing if this is a, an issue. I think planter speed is one of them. Some of the older equipment in particular, you gotta watch our, our speed. Um, but, you know, looking at, um, you know, if you've got a plate planter, make sure you've got the right plate for your seed size. Make sure your vacuum setting is correct. You know, uh, disc openers, uh, seed tubes that are clogged or out, you know, not in the right position, finger uh, pickups that are warm, seed tube sensors that aren't functioning, you know, cultures and disc openers that aren't lined up. And, you know, all of these things can contribute to uh, doubles and triple seed drops. And, um, and if we get a lot of this, you know, sometimes, especially in a year where we're lacking rainfall, uh, you know, we get some unfair competition on those, um, on those later, um, later, later emerging corn plants. So the other thing, you know, that I look for is I'd like, you know, ideally I'd like to have that nice picket fence plant spacing. Um, but I'd also like to have most of the corn come up within a couple of days. And if we have warmer temperatures and we plant at the right depth, we're a lot more successful doing this um, compared to, you know, if we're planting into wetter and colder conditions. So, you know, when you go out and you see um, a big variation in when the plants are coming up, several days from the time the first one came up, um, you know, to the time that the last one came up. That is uh, due to field conditions um, in, in its planting depth. Um, you know, you're planting too wet, you got a lot of clods, crusting soil, but it's also some of the planter settings as well that can dictate, you know, um, seed placement. Um, we have used seed firmers, and I think farmers, you know, most farmers at least have seed firmers, you know, on their planters now. I've been really happy with these. I think they help improve seed placement in the furrow, as long as your culture's uh, uh, culture depth is, is set right and your closing wheel pressure is good. Um, I think seed firmers are a good investment. Um, and there are some other worn uh, planter parts that, that can contribute to seeds not dropping. Um, at a uniform depth in the furrow. 
Um, and then, you know, putting too much closing wheel pressure is another one of those um, that, that um, if you, you put a lot of pressure on those closers, sometimes it can actually force the seed up in the furrow um, and shallow it up. So when you, you know, when you've got plants, you know, that are coming up, up, you know, within a couple of days, usually they're pretty uniform. But if you've got plants that are delayed multiple days and you've got corn that's six leaves and you've got corn that's three leaves and one leaf, then you've got a, you know, you've got an emergence issue. Um, you know, obviously it's not uniform. So, you know, again, you know, corn is very competitive. And so corn that comes up late, and it, especially if it's in the vicinity of a plant that came up early, um, it's going to have limited growth. And there's more potential for small ears or even barren plants, uh, depending on how close that plant is um, you know, to, the, to the first one that, that, that came up. So uniform emergence uh, is, is always kind of, uh, you know, what I'm shooting for. Uh, because that usually means that my maturity is going to be more uniform uh, later in the season. So the other thing is um, planting depth. Um, you know, I think with corn, you know, we get into trouble if we plant too deep, especially if it's cold and wet. But I see more issues from, you know, corn just not planted deep enough. Um, so, you know, the big thing with corn is, you know, <clears throat> it's, it develops um, what's called nodal roots. So when your seedling emerges and um, it's growing out, it, it's going to produce these little nodal roots that anchor the plant. And they're also going to help take up water and nutrients and kind of give that, that plant the support that it needs, you know, for rapid growth. The shallower, you know, that, that seed ends up, it has to have soil for those roots to grow and develop. And so if you plant it too close to the surface, the roots don't develop and you have something at the very worst called rootless corn. Um, or if you have impaired nodal root growth and you've got just a few ro roots here and that means that that plant is not taking up, you know, water and nutrients compared to the others. And it, it's going to be a different size. So when I'm planting corn, I'm always looking at two inches. That's kind of my target depth. but I'm always going to look at the field. I'm going to look at the weather, and I might change that depending on what's coming up. So if it's April 20th, and you know I have got to plant corn, it's April. Come on, we got to go, and I'm going to plant it. You know, and let's just say it's cold and wet, or maybe there's some rain coming. I'm going to shallow it up a little bit. So I might look at like an inch and three quarters. Sometimes an inch and a half, although again, you just gotta be real careful to not go too shallow. The other option is just to wait it out and wait for the weather to improve, the field to dry up, um, and then come back in. If it's dry and you know we've got we've had springs before where you know we're planting and there's no rain in sight and we've got some moisture, but it's down there a little bit, you know, then I'm gonna plant that seed, you know, a full two inches, maybe two and a half inches to moisture. And if by doing that, I'm giving it the best shot at taking up um, the amount of water that it needs to germinate. So you're going to get, you know, um, uniform germination and hopefully uniform emergence by planting that seed a little bit deeper to moisture um, in, in dry conditions. So we can plant too deep and, and I have done it. Um, this was kind of one of those teachable moments that, um, that we kind of stumbled across at Milan a couple of years ago. Um, we, we do a lot of four row equipment um, work and we were planting corn in a, a plot that we were gonna do a, um, a nitrogen study on. And we had three people trying to set the, 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 uh, uh, the depth you know, fiddling with the depth gauges, and one got confused and, and went backwards. So we ended up with a four row planter with three rows that were at the right depth for the conditions, and it was wet and cold, and then one row that was way too deep. And I um, went back out to the field, and the corn started to come up, and we noticed a huge difference in the first day of emergence. So we took uh, pink flags and basically marked each, each seedling as it came up, so this is, uh, I think, a 40 or 50 foot section. And you can just see this is the correct depth. We got lots of corn up. And this is the deeper depth. 
You know, it's just not coming up, it's slow. So when we plant too deep, um, you know, the corn has to use a lot more energy to push out of the ground. And again, if the ground is wet and cold, you know, it, it, it can struggle. Um, in our particular study, we, we did stand counts and if we planted too deep, we lost about a thousand plants to the acre and we shifted when the corn came up. And so with the optimal planting date, we're, we're putting a lot out of the ground in the first two days and that's really good. That's what we want to shoot for. But with the deeper depth, you know, there were shifting emergence, you know, to those later dates. And some of those corn plants just didn't make it. The, um, the other thing that we looked at was, you know, ear development, you know, at the end of the season, because Purdue has done some work looking at um, emergence, the timing of emergence um, and um, grain yield. And they, they've recorded, I think, seven to 15 bushel reductions in grain yield where you get this delayed emergence, especially under cold conditions. And what we found was when we just kind of did kind of an ear sample and we counted kernels, we found that, that our ear length uh, decreased with each day that it took for the corn to come up. And if we planted too deep, that decrease was even more uh, uh, noticeable. So if this was ear length, so it was the number of uh, kernels per row decreased uh, with each delay in, um, in emergence. Again, we weren't able to take this one to yield because we just had you know, single rows, but um, there's no doubt that we did impact our, our stand and we also impact our ear size uh, by planting too deep. This is another one of those <clears throat> kind of teachable moment things and this has to do with closing wheel pressure. Um, you know, we've had, um, I think, a lot of springs where it's wet and cold and we do the best we can. Um, this was a study we were looking at row cleaners and different closing attachments in a cover crop scenario. So we had burned down our cover crop about three weeks before we were ready to plant the corn and came back in. We were supposed to plant X number of weeks after the, the burn down, so we had to do it. It was wet. I think the field was just barely plantable and it was cold. And then we had about another week to 10 days of cloudy, um, you know, wet weather. If it were my choice, I probably would have delayed planting and waited for the weather to improve, but we, we did it because we, we had to be on schedule here. Um, but my technician was working with the closers and, you know, he, no he noticed that he had to kind of, you know, dial that, uh, that pressure up in order to close the furrows where they looked like they were, you know, closed and, and doing a good job. And the rubber wheels, uh, we had cast iron rubber wheels, we had this spike rubber combo and then a single wheel uh, option. The rubber wheels didn't look like they were doing a good job, even with the, the pressure, you know, cranked up. And I thought, well, we're going to have some trouble with that. But what happened was we actually had trouble with the, with the uh, more aggressive closing attachments because we ended up with sidewalk compaction because we had too much pressure on those closers in cold, wet soil. And so when the corn started to come up, I noticed it was uneven. You know, you hit plants of different sizes. Um, and then when I looked at ear development, Later on in the year, we had more um, barren stalks in, in our plots where we had you know, the sidewall compaction and, the, and too much pressure on the closer. We actually had about a 12 bushel increase in yield with the rubber closing wheels. And it's just because they did not pinch that burrow. They didn't put, you know, pinch that row and cause those problems like some of the other um, you know, specialty closures that we were looking at. So again, Kind of a teachable moment, but it, it's, it's definitely, it definitely can make an impact on corn growth. And, you know, there's always the potential, I think, to impact corn stand um, if you're not, if your planter is not set correctly for the field. And we always check behind the planter. You know, we do a lot of, we have a lot of four row equipment. You know, some of it's older, so things wear out. They're not working the way they need to. Um, and so, you know, every year we always check behind the planter. And I know there are newer planters now that can practically plant the field without a farmer driving the tractor. 
but you know I still think that it's always a good idea decide what you want check behind the planner and make sure that it's doing what you want it to do so that you're not getting any surprises uh, you know later on so uh, I'm going to just kind of change gears here I'm not going to spend a lot of time on silage fertility recommendations um, my understanding is there was a meeting maybe a a couple of weeks ago and Sean Hawkins maybe shared some of his data and talked about some updates to the fertility recommendations. Um, you know, just kind of standard things, soil test every, you know, one to two years to monitor particularly potassium levels behind silage because we are removing so much, um, you know, with the crop, um, especially in fields where it's, you know, uh, continuous silage. And then, you know, manure rates obviously are going to be based on uh, soil phosphorus level. <clears throat> I think looking at some of Sean's data, um, he is, has, re, re, or I guess he's generated data that suggests that silage is actually removing more P and K than thought previously. So those numbers are being revised. I believe sulfur is the same. Um, that table at the bottom is from our silage production guide and it's, you know, um, nitrogen recommendations and I believe Sean is going to revisit this one as well and maybe draw the lines just a little bit differently, especially to address higher silage yield situations. Um, I'm not sure that he's, he's looking at increasing a nitrogen rate recommendation, uh, but I think he's got some, some interesting data that, that indicates the importance of applying the right nitrogen rate, um, you know, for your production, um, and, and that has to do with um, improving crude protein. Like you, you do a good job with nitrogen, crude protein levels are are, are uh, much improved. So I thought I would just talk a little bit about nitrogen and <clears throat> some ways to put nitrogen out because we got some newer data looking at nitrogen application, uh, side dress type applications in corn, different products, different ways to apply. Um, you know, from the standpoint of nitrogen, obviously, you know, in a dairy situation, there's, uh, there's an option to use manure to apply some of the starter nitrogen in the crop. Uh, for corn, whether I think it's grain or silage, we always recommend that you split apply nitrogen. So some nitrogen at planting, and that's going to basically carry that, you know, that young corn until you can get back in and put the side dress on. You can put nitrogen out at planting, but um, there's a reason for trying to delay some of that, and it has to do with nitrogen uptake in corn. Um, this is a figure here that just kind of shows uh, nitrogen uptake uh, based on the developmental, developmental phases of the corn and it looks like at, by the time you see a tassel that that corn has taken up less than 60 percent of the total nitrogen that it's going to use um, you know that season and then obviously this is for grain but it's still going to be similar i think in a lot of ways for silage so the, the mindset is that if you put everything out at planting, it's got to have, you know, it's going to go through all the rainfall, all the conditions that can, you know, increase loss. But if you delay some of the nitrogen, um, and, you know, a little bit later in the season, uh, then hopefully we can offset, uh, you know, any loss issues and, and keep that nitrogen or enough of that nitrogen available for that plant to use. Um, you know, as it grows and develops. So it's always a good idea, I think, to try to side dress part of the nitrogen um, in corn. And um, for uh, UAN or urea, you know, we want to irrigate it or uh, incorporate it within a couple of days to reduce the, the chance for surface volatilization loss. There are products that stabilize surface applied UAN and urea. Um, the active ingredient NBPT, which is in the old Agritain products, it's also in a newer product called Anvol. Um, they do a pretty good job of protecting surface applied fertilizer from uh, loss and basically buy you some time, um, you know, until you can get some rain on it. So we wanted to look at 
you know, how we put nitrogen out. Because, you know, I get questions a lot from, from folks that, well, is liquid better than dry? Um, you know, how do I, you know, if I put my liquid out this way, is it better to do this or this? Or, you know, do I need a stabilizer with all of these methods? And so we did a kind of a head-to-head -head comparison of liquid and dry and, um, you know, other options for side dressing nitrogen. And this is a dry land study. Uh, the field got a total of 189 pounds of N, but our side dress rate was 120, and that was for all of the treatments um, out there. Um, this was this past year, so we got rain about three days after all the treatments, the side dress treatments went on, and it was uh, a very high yield dry land corn type situation. So we looked at 32% with and without anvil stabilizer and different placement methods. So this is basically, I'm calling this injected, but this is spraying it down behind a coulter, down the row middles. And this is a middle dribble or a, a, a drop nozzle that will do a middle dribble or a stream, uh, a Y drop, which splits um, and directs that application closer to the corn rows. And then we've got some folks that uh, are broadcasting UAN with their herbicide boom. Um, so that was one of the treatments as well. The dry treatments, we did uh, urea with and without a stabilizer and compared it to these specialty fertilizers, um, Super U, that comes treated for you with two different types of stabilizers, and then the ESN, which is a, a, a coated urea that's a slower release. And we included a, ammonium nitrate as our chick. One of the, you know, uh, questions that I get you know, sometimes with um, uh, side dressing nitrogen is, you know, well, I burnt my corn, have I injured my corn? Um, surprisingly, um, you know, corn can, can withstand a you know, good deal of, uh, of leaf burn. Um, the, all of the treatments that we looked at, the majority of them just barely, uh, you know, nipped the leaves on the corn. Um, the two that, that caused probably the most leaf burn were the UAN broadcast and the ammonium nitrate, um, which we, you know, we kind of expected to see that. So we got about 25%, you know, or roughly 18 to 25% leaf burn about seven days after the side dress timing. And then by 14 days, a lot of that had diminished. And this is the um, broadcast UAN about 10 days after treatment. And you can still see some of the burn on the leaves, but the new growth looks good. We had rainfall, we had good conditions for growth, and, um, and the corn grew out of it. So the UAN placement methods, I'm just going to kind of summarize these. Um, so one of the common, you know, common ways to put UAN out is with a, a drop nozzle and a stream or a dribble uh, right down in the middle behind, you know, some of these are going to fall behind the wheel tracks. Um, what we found was that if we put it out this way, the grain yields for this particular treatment were equal to a Y drop placement or the injected type placement. So all three of those yielded similarly. With the, uh, this particular uh, treatment, uh, we found that we had increased yield if we added a nitrogen stabilizer. So this particular treatment is gonna cost you a little bit more for the nitrogen um, to help stabilize it, but we got a, a nice yield increase by, by adding that. And some you know, folks like this method because it's a fairly easy setup on a boom. You don't have to be real precise with the placement and because you're directing it down the middles, you're not burning the corn. So um, the Y drop, this is something that's kind of different, um, but it basically directs uh, nitrogen again to the, you know, to the corn rows, not down the middles. And I think the corn probably picks it up a little quicker because, you know, again, we got rain uh, uh, within about three days. Um, yields were very similar to the middle, middle dribble or injected. Um, and what we found was with the Y drop, we actually didn't need a nitrogen stabilizer. Um, our yields were the same whether we put it in or not because we were placing it closer to the row. So we're saving, you know, uh, a few pennies uh, per pound of in, you know, on that stabilizer cost. Uh, you know, one of the downsides is obviously it's, it's, a, it's an equipment expense and you do have to be kind of precise about how you place it. Make sure that, you know, you're directing it at the base of the corn and you're not burning, um, you know, those plants um, as you drive down the road. But it was is equally effective yield-wise as a couple of other ways of putting it out. 
Um, spraying nitrogen behind the coulter, this is a standard way for a lot of folks. It's a great way to put nitrogen out in corn. It's, you know, it's slow and cumbersome and, and some folks, you know, hate it, um, but it's still a terrific way to do it. Um, yields were, were very similar to the middle dribble or the wide drop. And what we've also found is that in some of the cover crop work that I've done, if you can use this method to put your nitrogen out um, and, and basically put the UAN below the cover crop residue, we've had increases in yield in corn planted into cover crops. So it's, it's a, you know, it, it, there's some good advantages, I think, by using it. We did not need stabilizer if we use this method. So you're saving again some money um, and, and you're, you know, it, it has to be adjusted right. We're trying to get it as much of it down into that slot as we can. So it's sort of pre you know, precision placement um, there. So the last method was broadcast and um, not a lot of folks doing this, but we've had more folks ask about it um, because it's uh, easy. They don't have to have drop nozzles. They don't have to worry about things clogging up or something coming off. And they're just spraying a UAN over the top of corn. Um, so, you know, obviously there's some leaf burn, <clears throat> um, but, you know, with this method, because you're spraying it over a large surface area, you got a lot of potential for ammonia volatilization loss. So we had to have a stabilizer to make this one work. Um, if we added the stabilizer, yields improved, uh, but I would say that out of the four placement methods, this was probably the least effective because even with the stabilizer, we were still yielding below uh, you know, what some of these other uh, placement methods, you know, was giving us. So it, it, it has its advantages, but in my opinion, it's probably less, you know, uh, lower yielding. Um, granular urea, um, and again, we've got plans to repeat this work this year, both at um, Springfield and in West Tennessee. Um, but uh, adding a stabilizer to urea, it basically performed as well as, you know, some of these specialty fertilizers that probably cost a little bit more. So just kind of something to keep in mind. Um, you know, it, it worked, uh, worked equally well. So, you know, kind of the, the take home is there, there are lots of ways that we can put nitrogen out. And again, surface applied urea or UAN uh, with the exception of the Y drop, you know, you're going to have to spend a little money, I think, on a stabilizer, but, you know, they can be very effective ways um, to put the material out. So I know we're kind of limited on time, and I'm just going <clears> to <throat> kind of go through this real quick, but we've done different types of projects over the year in corn, and um, I thought, you know, I'd just kind of go in there and make a table, you know, what kind of worked, what gave me statistically increased yields in corn and what was kind of inconsistent. Because uh, some of these might be of interest in the silage situation too. Obviously irrigating, you know, it's kind of a no-brainer. Um, planting early, five out of five times we got an increase. Um, stabilizer on surface urea. Um, fungicide applied at tassel, you know, for things like gray leaf spot, you know, very effective. And we've had some pretty good results with pre-tasseled nitrogen. Um, you, you know, delay or basically taking about 30 units of your planned total and delaying it to closer to tassel um, to basically, you know, make sure that that at the very end of the season there that you've got an adequate amount. Not everybody is set up for that, but it's it's something that that can be effective, you know, with the right equipment. So things that didn't work quite as well, uh, starter fertilizer, you know, it's not really consistent. Inferral fungicide or fungicide applied, you know, early. Um, the only time I would consider this one would be maybe a hybrid that has standability issues. It, there's the potential for uh, to reduce green snap. Um, I looked at my, microbial products in furrow and I've had, you know, mixed results there. And then with corn, you know, we don't always get a, re a yield response by going to a narrower row. Um, you know, it, it, you know, 30 inch rows tend to work, you know, pretty darn well in a lot of situations. So just kind of a snapshot there of some things that we've been doing. And I'm just going to kind of wrap up here talking about harvest real quick. Um, Corn, um, you know, the development of corn is uh, temperature driven. 
So crop like soybeans, it's day length driven. Um, with corn, uh, corn has to accumulate heat units or growing degrees um, in order to go from stage to stage to stage. And so as corn <clears throat> goes from vegetative to reproductive towards these later reproductive stages, the moisture in the plant is gonna decrease. Um, the amount of decrease is going to depend, I think, on when you plant, the kind of conditions that it's growing in and, and the relative maturity probably of the hybrid. So the number of heat units is gonna vary too, uh, depending on the hybrid um, that you plant. But typically, Silage is harvested somewhere after dent, but before um, black layer. So a couple of ways to determine, you know, if, if your field is ready to go. Um, the grab test doesn't require a dryer, uh, but, you know, chop it up, you know, squeeze uh, the silage and, um, you know, kind of gauge how, how well it holds together and if it's got a lot of liquid coming out of it. Um, you know, if possible, it's always best, I think, based on what I have read to um, take samples from the field and actually dry them down and get a moisture estimate because there can be, you know, a good bit of variability um, depending on, on what you're doing. And, and in order to do a good job in siling, you know, you want your moisture to be, uh, to be right. So I mentioned that a lot of times we're harvesting after dent. And uh, R5 or dent, um, it begins about 30 days from silking. So if you're keeping up with the crop and you see the tassels, you see the silks, then you can think, okay, about a month from now, I should start to dent. So the denting process basically means that the, um, the liquid starch, this white stuff, uh, converts to hard starch. And hard starch is this bright gold. And as it converts, it will pull that tip of that kernel in and form the dent. So <clears throat> when you look for, uh, there's something called the milk line, which is just kind of showing the progress of starch conversion. Um, you get basically um, a white line that moves from the tip of the kernel towards the base. And it takes about three weeks for all of that to happen. Um, in this particular example, this would be a half milk line because it's about halfway down the kernel, so it's about halfway there. It's also a good time uh, to cut silage uh, as long as the plant moisture, um, you know, is, is correct because I think the crude protein digestibility and some of the other things are good, you know, at this particular time. The other thing about checking the milk line, um, if you take, go out to the field and you pull an ear and you break it in half, um, a, a kernel of corn has two sides to it, or two faces, I'll say. The tip end of the ear uh, will show you the milk line. The bottom end of the ear basically just shows you the seed, the embryo. So you're gonna break that ear in half, you're gonna look at the tip end, and you're gonna look for that milk line. Again, about three weeks for it to go from the tip down toward the cob. And the, the next stage is physiological maturity or black layer. And that's is about 30 days after dent starts, so about 60 days from silking. And at black layer, um, the uh, kernels have basically converted to hard starch, um, that there's a, 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 a series of cells that form at the base where that kernel attaches to the cob and they're black. And that basically means that the plant can't put anything else into that seed and it's considered physiologically mature. The, you know, some of the information that I have read indicates that if you wait um, to black layer or beyond, you're looking potentially at lower crude protein or digestibility. And there may also be issues with the, um, the dryness of, um, of the silage itself. <clears throat> so typically, you know, erring, erring a little bit on the earlier side, although as long as it's not too wet, uh, might be best. Um, I get questions sometimes about predicting, you know, when corn's going to tassel. And I thought I would share this with you. It's, it's free. Uh, the University of, or, uh, University of Illinois put this together uh, for the Midwest states, and they've added Tennessee. Um, but basically, you can plug in, and I'm, if this link will work, um, let me see if it'll let me 
and I have to turn the laser pointer off. <clears throat> Basically, so you click on the link and it will take you to, um, you know, a tool that you can plug in some numbers. So here I'm going to plug in, let's just say my plant. I'm going to plant April 21st and my corn is 118 day maturity corn. Um, and it basically just kind of uses historical data to predict in this particular location, you know, when you're going to uh, silk and when you're going to be at black layer. And it gives you kind of a range of um, uh, early, you know, kind of on either side, uh, but an average. But it gives you kind of, you know, your freeze information. Um, I find this to be particularly helpful if I'm not able to, to go by and look at a field very often. I want to just kind of predict when I might need to be out there. Um, you can also go to, I think there's a data table here, but it'll allow you, it, it'll basically show you, you know, all the, the, the dates when you're going to hit some speed, you know, these specific uh, growth stages during the season. So if, you're, if your silking date is about July 6th, then you can say, okay, I'm probably going to be black are starting to dent around August the 6th. So kind of just helpful, especially for fields that we just don't have an opportunity maybe to keep an eye on. There are some other tools out there. I just think this one is, is pretty neat. Um, there's some other things that you can do with it, but I just thought I would share um, that with you as well. So with that, I think that was the end of my presentation. Um, let me see if I can open the chat box here. Okay, well, uh, does anyone have any questions? Thanks, Angela. Yeah, a lot of those chats were from me. And I'm just going <laughs> to put a shameless plug in real fast uh, with part of the Southern Organic Dairy grant that we got a few years ago here, we actually purchased some chipper shredders and some coster testers. So okay. those are located um, in our dairy areas across the states. There's one in Henry County, there's one in Robertson County, there's one in Marshall, there's one in Greene County, and there's one in Loudoun um, County as well. So as we're getting closer to that, I know we are a far cry away from harvesting right now, um, but as that gets closer, those tools are available for all of our dairy producers to use. Just contact your county agent and they'll reach out to that particular county office that's housing them for us um, and bring them out to you along with a coster tester so we can really dial in that forage quality before harvest. That's excellent. Anybody have any questions for Angela? Y'all can unmute, write them in the chat. They tend to be quiet, Angela, so this is not unusual. <laughs> well, I think, um, you know, if anybody has any questions after the fact, they, they can always drop me an email or give me a call, and I'd be glad to help. All right, well, thank you. Uh, oh, there's something in the chat. What's in the chat? Lots of things in the chat. Great job and thanks. And yes, Michael, you have been told not to talk on okay. several occasions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, that is correct. Uh, you're right, Jeff, it's not in Robertson. It is in Marshall County to share across the central region. So Matt Webb has custody of that one. Thank you for correcting me on that. <laughs> Just as a reminder, pretty please, um, if you need Master Dairy credit to go to, I'm putting it in the chat again, edu ww2021 so go to tiny.utk.edu slash ww2021 um, to fill out the completion report it's just so we know everybody was here today i don't have full names on a lot of this so i don't necessarily know who everybody's iphone belongs to so make sure you fill that out so we can get you credit for coming today well on that note i guess we'll wrap up i'll have this recorded posting later today so thank you so much angela for your time we really appreciate it